Just imagine, if you had to go and tell a family member that their spouse had just died, and you found out that because the deeds were improperly titled, that, you no long, that she no longer owned the land. And the court had decided that you need to get off the land now. It sounds pretty bad if you had to go do that. Well, actually, it gets worse. It's a tragedy. It's not a strictly unique tragedy here in the South, but it's a true story. And it's my family's legacy from 1905 in a place called Wall Hill, Mississippi, which is right on the Tennessee line, uh, 50 miles east of Memphis. My great-grandfather, Jace Wall, died prematurely owning a 640-acre tract that was just in his name only. And of course, he also died without a will. The adult men you see uh, standing in the background are his brothers who lived on the land with him and, and the whole family was farming it together. They had no title to it. So, my great-grandmother who's also not in this picture, was uh, Corinne. As they say, she collapsed under the pressure of the six small children you see standing towards the front. And they had also had a devastating drought the year before, and that's why they, they couldn't even pay the taxes. It wasn't unusual back then, uh, but they were uh, corn and uh, cotton growers and had lost everything the previous year. Marshall County declared my great-grandmother incompetent to be a landowner. And they didn't allow her brothers-in-law, the men in the back, to take ownership. Sheriffs took Corinne, my great-grandmother, away to a hospital. Those six children were then left extremely vulnerable with no parents. And the law at the time required that children had to be adopted all as one. They never broke up children. So the uncles couldn't say, well, I can take those two. And another one said, I can take those two. No, all six had to be taken together. That was just the law and how they handled uh, adoptions back then. So all six children, you see in the photo there, and the little boy with the little white, uh, it was actually kind of his uh, bed gown, is what they called him. And you don't see it, he's holding it onto his teddy bear. That's my, that's my grandfather. William. They were all taken away to a Masonic home in Meridian, Mississippi, where each of them stayed until they aged out at the age of 18. Nobody, again, could adopt six children to take on that much responsibility, so they all stayed there till 18 and were forced to leave. This caused my family, the next generation, from these grandparents and my granduncle, aunts, great aunts, uh, it caused them to teach their children, children, you've got a plan for every circumstance. You've got to be ready for everything and anything that possibly could happen. Because they saw it happen. They had migrated after the Civil War from North Carolina to Mississippi 
and bought this land together right after the war. But all of my family, and I mean all, because Jace had six brothers and two sisters. So that's how big the clan was that literally dispersed. Half of them went back to North Carolina. A couple of them heard about Texas was the next place to go, so they went to East Texas and tried to start farming there. So with planning focus in mind, my father, as he was taught, plan, get ready for everything. He came to me when I was 14 and he said, son, you've got to decide what you're going to do for the rest of your life now. And then you need to tell me where you're going to go to college. It's 14. I took him serious because I knew he was dead serious. He said, I'll give you two weeks. Guess what? I told him I wanted to grow up to be a forester. And that one of the best forestry schools in the South was in Mississippi State. Also, it was the only place I could afford state tuition because he said, you're going to pay for it. I said, well, I can't pay for it. <laughs> well, with that commitment to become a forester, uh, my father said, yes, I will help you out some. And, and I'm going to invest some money for you to, for your college. They didn't have 529 plans back then, you know. So he said, I'll put some money with this broker who's a friend of my friends. And uh, he put in whatever he had saved up at the time right at the market crash of 74. I know all of y'all in here remember 74. Jerry Ford's Whip Inflation Now, remember that? W-I-N. Interest rates were taken off first time and caused a crash. And he lost practically everything because he put it all at the top of the market. Uh, but he looked at me and he said, well, <clears throat> I'm sorry that didn't work out, son. But you've planned for what you're going to do, right? Because anything can happen, and it did. And I was taught that, that yes, I made a commitment. I knew my dad was going to help me. I looked at every avenue. I even tried to get into the military. I know that sounds strange in 1974, sure. Uh, Vietnam was still kind of winding down. <laughs> I went through the induction center and boy, they gave me a big thumbs up. Uh, you know, we're really going to need a good boy like you. And uh, I went through everything, and then I uh, got an assignment of, of which uh, Air Force Base I was going to go to. And <laughs> then I found out that I was colorblind. You can't do anything in the military, believe it or not, if you're colorblind. They say, well, you got a choice of being an MP or a cook. I passed. So I applied to go through uh, college under a co-op program uh, and where I would work a semester, go to school a semester, work a semester, go to school a semester. And even when I was at school, I did everything on campus. I scrubbed pots and pans in the cafeteria. I checked out books in the library, you name it, anything to uh, get money by. And that's all I had to live on and what I had to pay the tuition. So uh, I was determined I was going to make it no matter what. Because I, I had to plan for it. Uh, that handsome young man that's facing you right there, that's me. 39 years ago. I was the uh, Octippa County Forester, which is where Starkville is located, so I didn't have to move very far from my graduation. The Forester Commission had asked me to be the face of the Forester Commission at the 1984 New Orleans World's Fair. And this was uh, the first of publicity photos where, <laughs> believe it or not, they had a uh, 
life-size cutout, wooden cutout of me uh, made from that photograph. Of course, you see I'm standing there kind of all tensed up, my hands in my pocket. Uh, <clears throat> they wanted to take a picture so they could see the uh, commission patch on my shoulder, but I had coats on. It was 36 degrees out there in this uh, plantation that morning. <laughs> so I was freezing to death. They said, yeah, well, let you put your hand in your pocket. I came into forestry with that uh, desire to help landowners and create long-term plans for their woodlots. Uh, I understood why a 70-year-old plants a pine seedling. Then I had an opportunity uh, to take that kind of strategic thinking into the world of estate and trust planning. Well, so far I've told you about my family's tragic legacy. Now I want to tell you about how your family can avoid the same fate. I'm here today to sound the alarm of the tsunami of taxes to come in 2026. That's two and a half years from now. The tax code today is fairly favorable to most of y'all here in the audience. But unless Congress acts, the current tax rates expire at the end of 2025. Additionally, most provisions in the tax code will expire as well, creating a challenging tax planning environment for taxpayers. And even if you don't have a taxable estate now, you may have one in the next 10 years. That's what's called planning. So I want you to front run this from happening in the future and plan for whatever comes next. Well, let's begin to think of your timber as a corporation and use the advantages that corporations have over individual taxpayers. And I want to go over three strategies here that are corporate-like or have essences of a corporation, of a business that can be helpful to you. First is to create a partnership. A partnership is a great way to also set up transition to your heirs. What you do is set up the partnership and you use your annual gift exclusion, which this year is $17,000, to transfer undivided ownership to children and even grandchildren. You do this every year, you're going to end up with a much lower estate value because you're transferring out. When you set up that partnership, all of a sudden your timber has a 30% discount on its actual value. And this has been approved for many years, just like any other small business, of what is really what's called a non-controlling, non-marketable investment. It's not liquid, you know that. Of course, the timberland is not liquid, but the business then becomes illiquid and non-marketable. So when you have that discount applied, that $17,000 annual gift exclusion is bumped up that you can transfer $24,000 $500 of that value over. Also, by placing the Timberland in a partnership, the limited owners can't sell their, their share, their units out to anybody else except those in the partnership. So it gets pretty ironed clad when you need it to be. Now this is really a business. We're going to create a C corporation. Uh, most of all uh, familiar with LLCs, 
as corporations, as what's known as pass-through entities. Well, a C corporation is like thinking of any kind of big business. Apple, Microsoft, those are C corporations that have shareholders, corporate structures, ownership, all that kind of as a, as a real company would. Now, what's the reasoning behind possibly using a C corporation for your timber? Uh, is that corporations pay lower income tax than you do. Think about it. So you've got a little arbitrage you can create by having something taxed at a much lower rate than yourself. Man, that's really good. More importantly, that corporation is no longer in your estate because you're not the individual personal owner. You're, you're still owning shares of the corporation, but with the shares, you can still do those annual gifts just like you did with the partnership. But in addition, you can pay shares in the form of compensation to family members. Go hand Junior a drift torch and let him go out there for a day or so with you. Oh, we need to get you paid, son. Um, so with a corporate structure in place, it also doesn't have a limited time to be in existence. Uh, trust, on the other hand, do have a law against perpetuity. There are some states, Delaware, comes first to mind that allows you to do one of these uh, trusts that can go on for a hundred years. You got to pay up for it though to be able to do it in Delaware or Alaska or some of those other states. I think North, there, North Dakota has also started that as well. But um, it's also, it's very difficult, cumbersome to, I think, have the trust managed uh, so far away where you only get to talk to somebody on the phone and rarely get to see them. Now, and of course, there's, there's a trust. And uh, as Perry had talked about in my, in my career, I spent 15 years as a bank trust officer, both as a planner for the bank, uh, as well as an administrator. And so it was trust, 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 trust. That's all, all I did. So uh, they're out there. There are all kinds of trust, you know, that, that are out there. I'm not going to go into the nomenclature of everything. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a real laundry list there. But I want you to hear me this, because I'm not, I'm not selling any structure or strategy. Okay, it's more what's in line with what the family needs as a conduit to minimize estate taxes, what everybody's comfortable with. But in situations where you don't have anybody to leave it to that you trust, leave it in a trust, okay? So that's my word on the three choices you have. If you can't trust, leave it in a trust. You need to have a professional trustee, not a family member, does cost a little more, because that is the kiss of death. If anybody's ever had to be an executor or a trustee for their family, that is a horrible job. Even now I'm having to settle my own mother's estate. It is a horrible job, and I do it as this is a professional, but when it becomes personal, it's terrible. <laughs> uh, so when you have a third party professional trustee, the kids can blame the trustee. Oh, that guy's terrible, he doesn't know what he's doing. Man, I wish dad was still here, because I know he would he'd set him up straight. He wouldn't let him do that. Well, that's what the trust document probably says, and that's what Dad really wanted. 
So you get the blame off of your back, you're gone, right? Also, one important item, if you've got a, a substantial amount of life insurance, you really need to have that placed into an irrevocable trust. And what do you mean insurance in a trust? When you die, the death benefits are tax-free to your heirs, to your beneficiaries, whomever. But that $1 million policy value is in your estate. So it's just added on top of your other assets, timberland, investments, real estate, life insurance. So that million gets tacked on for calculation purposes. And I, that itself might put you above the new 5.5 million exemption that's going to take place in 2026. So if you put it in this trust, it's gone beyond a arm's length transaction and possibly keep you under the radar of taxation because once it hits that 5.5 million in 26, Uncle Sam takes it at 40% right off the top or every dollar. So it's quite a, quite a haircut. According to a recent UBS wealth management survey, the most concerning issues in estate planning for high net worth families is whether the transfer assets will go smoothly. Of course, yeah, that's probably the most pressing. Then the next most pressing issue is whether they are transferring their estate in the most tax optimized way. Nobody wants to pay taxes on your stuff. Last but not least is the worry whether their children will use the inheritance wisely. Somehow, I, maybe it's just me personally, to me that's always going to be the number one worry out there. I did a Google search and, and for uh, Fortune magazine, they, they quoted a, another website called GoBankingRates.com that actually found out that 70% of wealthy families have their wealth lost in the first generation. That's, that's your children we're talking about. 90% families lose it by the second generation. It's pretty, pretty bad odds there, right? Uh, but it's not anything new. Benjamin Franklin in his Poor Richard's Almanac says, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. It was true then and it's so true now. If you don't know what that means by shirt sleeves, I'll tell you in the breakout session. Well, Perry's flagged me. So we'll have this to ponder, and I also will be in the Dogwood Room here at 11. 11? Yes, sir. So thank you very much. Thanks, Larry.